All right. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, and I am very happy to present the PhD thesis defense of Kyle Kalasaris. Um, this is a really uh, happy occasion. And um, I can just tell you a little bit about uh, uh, Kyle's experience here at UCI over the past several years. Uh, Kyle arrived here from UC Merced in 2017, is that right? That's right. And I remember in fall of 2017, getting an email from Kyle saying, hi, I'm a new student here, and I came to UCI thinking that I'd be probably interested in doing condensed matter physics, but I've gotten kind of interested in astronomy too, and would you be interested in uh, meeting to talk about research opportunities? And I said, sure, we, we, we made an appointment. And normally when you have these, kind of first meetings with a new student, it's a very informal conversation. You tell them a little bit about what you're working on and then they ask a few questions. But Kyle came like extraordinarily well prepared in a way that I've never seen with any other student before. He had a long list of questions and like a checklist of questions he was going through and, and really interrogated me in great detail about the group's research and my style of working with students and how the group functioned and a whole, uh, a whole long list of things. And I, I was really impressed at how systematically he approached this whole decision of uh, what uh, research group he wanted to work in, which is of course a really important decision. And by the end of this discussion, I felt like I was being, that I, I, I was the one being interviewed or, or that I was auditioning to be Kyle's advisor. And fortunately, I guess I passed the audition. And uh, so uh, uh, very, very glad that, Kyle made the decision to join the group, and uh, he started working on this project that he'll be telling you about today using observations from the ALMA Observatory and the Hubble Space Telescope to measure the masses of black holes in nearby early type galaxies. And to do this, he basically started from scratch developing a lot of new Python code to do a, a, this was a project that my group had started on a couple of years earlier, but we were using kind of rudimentary code that was sort of left over from earlier generations of projects. And for Kyle's project, he started from scratch to develop new code that was really tailored to this purpose and to do it all in a much more systematic and more rigorous and better way. And he did a fantastic uh, job with all of that. Um, I can say also having had Kyle in one of my classes in the galactic astronomy class. Uh, he did a, a great job uh, academically. He was really meticulous as a, as a student. And I saw the same thing in just how he did a lot of his work over the years. Even uh, when we went for observing runs to Lick Observatory, he was the kind of student who would plan ahead for cloudy nights by bringing along a copy of Vinny and Tremaine to the observing run just so that if there was any downtime, uh, no time would be wasted and he could spend his time learning more astrophysics. So um, that's that's the kind of student that uh, Kyle has always been. And uh, another thing that I wanted to say about working with Kyle over the last few years is, as you all know, the, the last few years has been in many ways an extremely difficult and challenging time for students. And during the summers of 2020 and um, 2021, in my group, we had Calbridge students from uh, Cal State who joined the group to do summer research projects. And this was during the time that the campus was fully shut down and everything was going on remotely. And um, Kyle volunteered to mentor these undergrad uh, summer students to work on ALMA data for their first research experience. And he went really above and beyond the call of duty in mentoring these students and making sure that they had a really good summer research experience, even during this time when you know nobody was meeting in person and everything was being done over Zoom. And I think that uh, in the end, the, the fact that uh, these students had good summer research experiences and then both of them went on to PhD programs, uh, I think a lot of credit goes to Kyle for just being an outstanding mentor to the undergraduate undergraduates that he's worked with over the years. And as, I think, as you all know, he's been a really positive presence in the department for the last uh, six years. And I think everybody who knows Kyle will really miss him when he's gone from the department. But for now, we're here to celebrate Kyle's accomplishments and to hear about the work that he's been doing with Alma and HST for the 
last several years. But Kyle, take it away. Oh, wow. Thank you, Aaron, for that uh, wonderful introduction. So thank you, everyone. I'm really excited today to tell you about my research that I've been working on here for the past five years on making black hole mass measurements with ALMA and the Hubble Space Telescope. So to start, let's just give a brief outline as to where we're going to go. So I'm going to start by talking a bit about the relationship between galaxies and supermassive black holes. I'll talk about different ways of how their masses are measured. And then I'll talk about the PhD research objectives that I had when I started this work. I'll go into the actual framework itself, give some details as to what goes into it, how it does what it does in making the mass measurements. And then I'll list a few, or I'll go through a few of the projects that I've worked on over the years on making mass measurements in different systems, and then I'll conclude. So to start, just to make sure we're all going to start on the same page, let's just clarify what black holes are in the first place. So just as a very brief introduction, black holes are regions of space-time where gravity is so strong that nothing, not even light, can escape from it. You can imagine when we launch objects like rockets off of Earth, we have to get them, or if we want to have a rocket escape the Earth, for example, you have to accelerate it to 11 kilometers per second. Uh, but if you have a black hole, there's just no speed whatsoever that you can attain to break free. Now, Supermassive black holes are going to be the main subject of my talk. They, these are behemoths that live at the centers of massive galaxies. They can have masses between a million and over tens of billion times the mass of the sun. So this is a very famous image here of a black hole in M87 from the Event Horizon Telescope in, in 2019. And one thing I'd like to point out is that Einstein's theory predicted these things, but Einstein himself did not actually believe that they were real. This is a excerpt from a paper he published back in 1939, where he's basically saying that the result of this work is that black holes do not actually exist in physical reality. There really wasn't any uh, obser strong observational evidence at the time. So I just find it amusing that my whole dissertation is on objects that Einstein himself did not believe were real. But let's get into supermassive black holes and their most galaxies now. So over the past 30 years or so, astronomers have discovered different scaling relations which relate the mass of the supermassive black hole to different large scale properties of the host galaxy. So on the x-axis here, you have the, uh, the galaxy bulge luminosity and the galaxy bulge central velocity dispersion, essentially measuring the brightness and the, sort of the range of velocities that stars uh, have at the center of these galaxies. Now, these properties are measured over a large scale that are beyond the volume that we think the black hole dominates the gravity. And so for, for, for some reason, the black holes and the galaxies are somehow talking to each other. And it's, it's given rise to this idea that black holes and their host galaxies co-evolve through cosmic time with one another. And so we need to have a, a reliable sample of precisely measured black hole masses to, to really understand these relations. They're not really well sampled as in there's not that many measurements on the low end and on the high end where sort of the early type galaxies are. And that's the types of galaxies that I primarily worked on during uh, my PhD. So how do you go and measure a black hole mass? It's not a trivial exercise. Well, to do that, you really need to probe the kinematics of tracer objects, so objects sort of in the gravitational potential or the gravitational field of the black hole. And you need to probe the kinematics of objects where the black hole really is the dominant contributor to the enclosed mass there. So what you're looking at here is a plot of circular velocity of some tracer object, maybe a star or, or some gas cloud. And the black curve is the velocity it would have, or the, the rotation velocity, the circular velocity it would have if it was just under the influence of the black hole. The red orange is where if it was under the influence of just the stars. And then the blue is the theoretical curve you would observe due to the combination of the two. And so really what we need to do is we need to probe on scales that are within what is known as the black hole's radius of, of influence. So this is sort of the points where the 
black hole and the stars kind of have an equal say in saying, you know, how are the objects moving? They're both effectively exerting the same kind of gravitational pull on these objects. We want to really work in a regime where it's the black hole that's calling the shots, so to speak, in the sense that it is dominating the total gravitational, gravitating mass in that system. But for most measurements over the past few decades, we're really working in the sort of the opposite regime where the stars are the dominant contributor to the total enclosed mass. Now, I know what everyone's thinking when they sort of see this yellow pie chart here. So which is why I think we need to just acknowledge that it's better to carry out black hole mass measurement in this regime, which I'm gonna call the, the anti-Pac-Man regime and not the uh, Pac-Man regime where the stars are the dominant source of the mass. So again, it's much more preferable to work in this regime where the black hole is the dominant contributor to the uh, total gravitational potential. Okay, so I also wanna point out that we're not entirely ignorant of the fact that there are other things that have mass in these systems, right? We have, uh, we have dust, we have gas, we have dark matter, but if we're working in what I think should be a scientific term, the strong anti-Pac-Man regime, then we really don't have to worry too much about these sort of subdominant components of the mass budget. So we really can focus on the supermassive black holes contribution and the contribution due to the stars. So back to some actually accepted science for a bit. The way to measure these black holes is that you, re you require a really powerful telescope to do that because you need to resolve on scales that are approximately a tenth of an arc second. Now, to give an idea of how small an angle that is, imagine taking a dime and moving it about two and a half miles away from your face. And that angle that dime will subtend is approximately one arc second, okay? So we need to do about 10 times better than that and sometimes even better than that. So we need a very powerful telescope. One of those powerful telescopes, of course, is the Hubble Space Telescope. It effectively enabled demographic studies of supermassive black holes in a just different range of galaxies and galaxy types through a large decade of, through three orders of magnitude in black hole mass. So again, every sort of step we go up here, it's not just, a single unit of measurement, we're talking about a whole power of 10, and that these trends hold over a large range in black hole mass, gives us some clue that there's there's gotta be something going on uh, between the black holes and their host galaxies. So back to the, the nuts and bolts of actually measuring these things, the two most common methods, the methods that have been used to populate these you know, demographic studies are with stars and with gas, or stellar dynamical modeling and mostly ionized gas dynamical modeling. And they both have their pros and cons to them. So first, stellar dynamics. Effectively, you're, effectively what you're doing is you're simulating the orbits of stars across this entire galaxy. And it's very computationally difficult. You have to account for stellar motions, not just near the center of the galaxy or near the black hole, where the black hole is dominant, you also have to account for an extended stellar mass distribution because stars can explore radii that are far from the black hole. And also you need to worry about like a dark matter halo. You also have to worry about the intrinsic three-dimensional shape of this galaxy. All of these factors have to come into consideration to get an accurate black hole mass. And then the other method, like I said, has been with gas. And so about 20 years or so, there was a paper that showed that these, some of these galaxies have a nice round sort of smooth disk of dust around their centers that some fraction of the time will have gas that's participating in roughly coherently rotating motion that can be used to constrain the mass of the black hole. Now, like I said, not all galaxies have these gas disks that can uh, be used to dynamically, dynamically model and measure the black hole mass. And 
they get the gas because it's a collisional fluid doesn't just respond to gravity it can respond to non-gravitational forces as well and so it can get pushed around more easily than stars so one problem is that these mass measurements when you are lucky enough to have a black hole that has been measured by you know both of these techniques they typically give uh, different answers so a very quintessential example of that is M87. Um, if you look here, I have a table of some of the more notable measurements made of M87's black hole mass over the past 45 years, even as recently as a couple of months ago. And we can see that the black hole mass with ionized gas dynamics are giving answers between like two and a half to three and a half billion times the mass of the sun. So dynamical measurements are giving something higher around six, five and a half, that's even one that goes as high as nine billion times the mass of the sun. And so there's clearly some disagreement here. And you know these disagreements could lead to an overall imperfect or inaccurate understanding of the scaling relations and our interpretation of you know, how black holes and their galaxies co-evolve through cosmic time. So it's very important to make some independent cross checks. If there would be great if there was some method that can you know, measure objects that have disagreements and try and really pin down precisely what the correct answer is. So now to introduce the hero of this story, we'll talk about Alma. So Alma is a very powerful interferometer in the Southern Hemisphere. It's in Chile. It was fully constructed in 2013. And at its longest baseline, essentially you can imagine spreading out these antenna across this plane here, it can resolve on scales you know, of order 0.1 or, or smaller, which gives us the ability to probe deep within the spheres of influence of nearby black holes. Now, what do these things actually target? What do they actually observe? What's the signal they're looking for? Well, for pretty much all of the targets in my dissertation, the molecule that we target is carbon monoxide. It's CO. Uh, CO has a transition, uh, a rotational transition, when the carbon and the oxygen rotate about their common center of mass. You have these rotational tr uh, electronic transitions. And we target a specific one that has a frequency of about 230 and a half gigahertz or 1.3 millimeters. Now, carbon monoxide is the second most abundant molecule in these. Uh, molecular clouds that we probe after their hydrogen. Uh, unfortunately, hydrogen does not have a dipole moment because it's two hydrogens attached to each other. So there's no dipole moment there. And so there's not an electronic transition that we can readily use in the wavelengths that Alma probes. And so we settle for TO, but not, maybe not settle because TO is pretty awesome. Um, speaking of which, surveys before Alma's time have found CO in disk-like morphologies in early type galaxies. And so the purple contours here uh, are, are contours of CO uh, brightness on, overlaid on these uh, dust images here. So the gas traces the filamentary dust structure. And Alma has already over the past several years since its construction, it has made some of the most precisely measured black hole masses to date. So to start, I'll talk about uh, NGC 1332. This is a target that Aaron uh, measured back in 2016. And it has a black hole mass of about 6.64 times 10 to the eight or 664 million times the mass of the sun. And not only was it uh, a very precise measurement, it revised a previous measurement um, of the black hole in the system that was more than a factor of two higher. So it has already you know, provided uh, cross checks. Another target that I'd like to point out is NGC 3258. It's, to my knowledge, the most precisely measured black hole mass with ALMA to date. This was conducted by my predecessor here, Ben Boisel, uh, in 2019. And you can really see that Alma has this ability to really get that kinematic signature isolated. This is sort of that central rise in rotation velocity due to the supermassive black hole. And this just demonstrates the, the power 
uh, Alma possesses to make these fundamental contributions. So when I arrived on the scene here in 2017, there was already quite a bit of Alma data recorded. Just to give you an idea, there was a few dozen rotating disks that had been observed with Alma over, um, you know, before I arrived and even since I arrived. And so there was a need to develop a framework that could readily provide robust estimates of black hole masses and sort of have model flexibility to account for motions that may not be perfectly, you know, circularly rotating and, and other aspects as well, which I'll talk about in the coming slides. So the eight that I managed to get to in my dissertation are these eight here, and I'll, I'll go into detail about some of them in the coming slides. So uh, research objectives. So what did I have to do? First off, as Aaron alluded to at the beginning of this talk, I had to build off of older frameworks that were written in uh, another language, IDL. And the idea was to sort of create a new code from scratch in Python that can create dynamical models that are fitted directly to all my data sets. And the idea was to build it and then apply it and measure as many black hole masses from the sample as possible, but also to understand the model limitations and the different systematic uncertainties that affect the precision of a given black hole mass measurement. So first, let's just talk about the framework now. Before we talk about that, we have to understand what ALMA observations actually give us. So when we receive ALMA data, uh, it comes in the form of what is known as a data cube. So a data cube here has two spatial dimensions and it has one spectral dimension, okay? And so at each pixel of this cube, there is a spectrum of the you know, electromagnetic radiation at that given observed point on the sky. And if we're looking at rotating disks, then the Doppler shift will determine the, the, the observed line frequency that we see. So we're kind of familiar with the Doppler shift in everyday life when we have an ambulance or a fire truck pass us, you know, the pitch of that siren gets really high. And then as it moves away, the pitch of that siren gets lower. And that's because of the, the sound waves are becoming more spread out. And um, in the context of rotating disks, light can also observe, can also uh, undergo a Doppler shift. And so this line can, can shift depending on the relative motion of the disk at that point. Uh, every image or channel in the cube corresponds to a very narrow specific range of velocity. So when we're looking at a given image, we're looking at parts of the disk that are moving with that given uh, rotational velocity or, that, or a given range of rotational velocities. And cubes can be sort of collapsed. You can imagine sort of summing across the, the third dimension there to form a two dimensional image. So we're projecting down from three dimensions into two dimensions and we can look at some of the information from two-dimensional maps as well. So the models that I've created themselves are synthetic data cubes. What the models try and do is to, or what they try and do is to re reproduce the motion of a thin rotating disk that's in the combined gravitational potential of the black hole, the extended stellar mass distribution, as well as the mass of the gas disk itself but it's typically the most, the gas I'm saying is typically the most or the, the least dominant component. It's the most subdominant component in terms of the mass budget. And so really we worry about the mass of the black hole and the, and the stars when it comes to these dynamical models. Uh, the, how you get the uh, mass of the stars is essentially we use Hubble Space Telescope images and we convert the observed brightness distributions from the Hubble images into, into mass profiles. And the synthetic cubes are built on the same spatial and spectral axes as the ALMA data. And we have a list of three parameters here that characterize the black hole mass, most importantly, but also other parameters that describe, for example, the disk orientation and stuff of the like. The uh, important thing is 
that I like to emphasize is that these models are actually fit directly to the ALMA data themselves. When we consider, for example, ionized gas dynamical modeling in the past, those typically, those models are typically fit to projections of the data as opposed to the data itself. And so what my framework does is that we are fitting models directly to the data in its sort of unaltered form. So not only did I construct a model for the signal that we observe, I also constructed a model for the noise in the data. Now, you might be wondering, why would you want to do that? Well, the noise in all my data cubes, shown in this picture here, uh, exhibits strong spatial correlations and is inherently non-Gaussian, which is a little bit problematic if you want to use the reduced chi-squared statistic shown here as your goodness of fit, because this statistical criterion assumes that the noise or the errors per se are Gaussian and they're uncorrelated. So a little bit of a problem if we want to use that. And just when you're reading these reduced chi-squared values in the rest of the slides, note that the ideal number is one if the model is a near uh, perfect fit to the observed data. So I developed a noise modeling routine that I do not want to get into the, the very intricate details of, but the idea is that it sort of mitigates the, the correlation that is seen in the noise and accounts for different properties that happens when the data gets transformed into a data cube. So a data cube is not the sort of the, the original form of how the measurements are taken, but it gets converted into a cube and that carries along some technical details due to the Fourier transform, which I will stop myself before I get started with that. But rest assured that the model that I've developed does its best to mitigate the correlation and give us a reliable high, reduced chi-square to use to, to measure the goodness of fit in these models. So about the host galaxy. So how do we, as I said before, we, we model the galaxies, the stars in a galaxy, with what are known as multi-Gaussian expansions or MGVs. I know there's a lot of acronyms here. So a multi-Gaussian expansion essentially is where you take enough Gaussian functions or another name would be normal distributions or bell curves if people have heard of those. And you add up enough of them, you can do sort of a, a series expansion and you can try and model a galaxy image. So for example, here's a, image of a galaxy uh, in a near infrared wavelength from Hubble. And if you take a dozen or so Gaussian functions, you can try to reproduce the observed brightness distribution that you see. And so this is just an image on the bottom left here of a two-dimensional Gaussian. So maybe we're, most people are familiar with the blue curves, but you can have it in two dimensions as well. And so that's how we characterize the host galaxy components in the models. Great, so now that you perfectly understand my framework, uh, we're gonna talk about applying it and measuring some black hole masses. So we're gonna talk about the black hole masses of NGC 1380 and NGC 6861. Those are the first two I applied my framework to. It was uh, published in the Astrophysical Journal about almost exactly a year to the date, if I'm not uh, mistaken. So let's get into it. First up, we'll talk about NGC 1380. This is a early type lenticular galaxy shown here in the Carnegie Irvine Galaxy Survey. If we zoom into the very center, we have a nice round long circumnuclear dust disk uh, that is traced by the molecular gas as seen here in the CO2 to one emission. And this is a target that had no prior measurement of its supermassive black hole, so that would be a great idea to try and be the first to, to do so. I'm going to give you the punchline first. So the punchline is the black hole in that system is about 147 million times the mass of the sun. Now, I have here the statistical uncertainty, which is rather small. It's about only between 1% and 2% of the best fitting value. But there is a fairly large systematic uncertainty, which I will get into in the coming slides. And again, sort of our, our goodness of fit measure for the reduced chi-squared, it's about one and a half, which you know, is, sounds good, but when we consider the amount of degrees of freedom, it's not a you know, formally acceptable 
uh, statistically acceptable fit. And so there are some systematic deviations that our models cannot capture in the data. So let's go ahead and talk about some of those visualizations just to sort of get an idea what all the pictures will look like. So going back to this diagram of a, of a data cube here, remember that at each pixel, we have a spectrum of the electromagnetic radiation at that point, and it can be Doppler shifted based on the speed of the gas at that point in the disk. And so here is some extracted line spectra from my model cubes and my data cubes. The blue are from the models and the black are from the data. And we can see that the models do a fairly good job, even in these cases where the line profiles are, are broad and asymmetric, that they do a fairly good job of, of recreating the observed shape, though some fine details are not entirely captured. The second visualization I'd like to show are what are known as position velocity diagrams, or other people might know them as rotation curves. So we're going to look at uh, a plot of the velocity of the, or the rotational velocity of the gas along the long major axis of this disk. And so it said here is a plot of the rotational velocity on the y-axis. This is distance from the center of the galaxy on the x. And you can see in the data here that the characteristic shape of a rotating, rotating disk is shown. You have sort of equal and opposite velocities, symmetric respect to zero. This indicates you have nice rotation. And again, we can sort of see that the models are doing, the model, I should say, is doing a fairly good job of getting that overall shape right. But there are some issues, for example, with like the, the, the observed line width. It can't really get the, the velocity dispersion quite correct and gives us an idea that there is some systematic deviations that are not accounted for in, in this sort of simple thin disk model. Now I'll talk about the sort of two-dimensional visualizations that we can look at. And so what those correspond to are two-dimensional maps of surface brightness, line of sight velocity, and uh, line of sight velocity dispersion going from the, from the top row to the bottom. And then the three columns represent the data, the model, and the data minus model residual. So again, the models are doing uh, a good job at recreating sort of the observed large scale structures of the disk, even beyond the sort of the, fit, the, 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 the region where the models were fit to the data, which is represented by the yellow ellipse up there. So models are doing a fairly good job, but the black hole mass does have, a quite, a, uh, does have quite a bit of uncertainty in it. And so I wanna talk about the um, uncertainties in the next slide, but I will conclude this slide with uh, just a nice animation of all the different channel maps, as in we're going to step through this cube and we're going to see how my models are tracing out the observed velocity structure um, of the data. And so, so we can see different parts of so the different parts of the disk are rotating at these um, different velocities and our model is trying its best to find the best set of free parameters that can, that can describe the motion in uh, the data. So let's talk about the systematics now, because that's one of the most important parts. So like I said before, the model fitting uncertainties are much smaller than the systematic uncertainties. We get the statistical uncertainties from doing uh, essentially a Monte Carlo simulation or a resampling procedure and getting the standard deviation of this distribution. So it's a fairly tight distribution centered around the best fitting black hole mass. And the systematics are derived through a number of tests that I carry out. So essentially you can imagine changing or tuning a few um, switches and moving a few dials and just changing different aspects of the model construction that could affect our, you know, sort of our interpretation of what's happening in the disk. So I'm not gonna get into the details of each and every one of these tests, but the punchline is that the tests that you, where you see the largest shift in the black hole mass involve changing the stellar mass models. Okay, so if you change the amount of stellar mass you have in the system, that's where you see the largest changes in um, black hole mass. So one of the problems that has uh, plagued me over the past several years has been this issue with the dust in these systems. So dust is 
problem when you want to model the observed brightness of a galaxy, because dust will preferentially scatter and absorb light at smaller wavelengths. And so what you see here is an image of the dust disk taken in two different wavelength filters, near-infrared wavelength filters from the Hubble Space Telescope. And you can see that the near side of this disk is highly reddened. And so the because dust will scatter and absorb light preferentially at smaller wavelengths or bluer wavelengths, the resulting observed light that we see is going to be red or more red. And so this reddening is an indication that there is uh, quite a bit of dust there. And it, like I said, complicates the, the host galaxy modeling process as in it makes it difficult to figure out you know, how much starlight is there and because we use the starlight to get how much mass. So we're assuming the mass follows the light, but if there's dust, that may not be entirely accurate. And so I developed a method to roughly approximate just how much dimming or extinction as we would call it properly there is um, along the, the long axis of this disk. Now, the way that it works is that effectively in this bottom left curve, you have um, something related to the reddening of this system that is a function of the extinction or the dimming or the absorption of light. Um, and this top left image has the reddening. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to, I had essentially this model of reddening as a function of how much dust there is or extinction, but I really want the opposite. So I have Y versus X. I really want X versus Y. Um, so I said to myself, why can't I get X versus Y? So what I did was that if you look at the shaded region, I actually fit a function to this part of the curve because it's not a one-to-one -one function if you invert it um, properly. And the idea is that now I can obtain an estimate of extinction or, or dimming or scattering of, well, all these effects are sort of incorporated in the assumptions we're making. But the idea is that we now have the extinction as a function of the reddening effectively. And what I can do is I can, in the top right plot, I can take the observed brightness, which is in the red points, and I can generate models that correspond to predictions of where the red points should be in the absence of dust. So the blue curve is the, is the method's prediction of what the brightness should be in the absence of dust. And what you can do is you can sort of create a range of models that sort of bound the amount of extinction or the amount of dust there is in these systems to generate different models of the host galaxy. Yes. You just think that the higher values of dust, you, you made the case that it's like multi values. So yes. Like, okay. Yes. Is it just like unphysical beyond that, or yeah. So that's a, that's a great point. So the question is, is are the everything to the right of this gray shaded region? Why don't we consider that? So you can, and typically what it, it tells you is if you try and use um, extinction of, of these levels, it pretty much just says you lose like ninety nine percent of the total light behind the disk, and so it doesn't really give us more information than it's you pretty much just lose all of the light, um, which is yeah. not. Um, yeah. It, it kind of gives you sort of like an, a, a a limit to um, how much light you're losing, but it doesn't give a maybe a, a lower, more reasonable value. So I did try the higher end. It just doesn't give very physical stuff. Um, so what this what this tells us, right? When we have sort of a large uncertainty, systematic uncertainty on the black hole mass, depending on which stellar mass model we use, if we take a look at the log of the enclosed mass of the stars or the MGE models as a function of log radius here, um, we can see that the mass of the profiles are pretty much equivalent at large radii towards the edge of the disk. That's where the, the, the mass budget is well constrained. But as you get closer to the resolution limit of the telescope uh, marked by this dotted line here, and you can see that there are these differences in the stellar mass profiles. And because we're sort of working in the regime where the stars in this case are kind of the, not kind of, they are the dominant uh, component of the mass budget, then the models have a hard time distinguishing 
you know, do we need more stellar mass and a lower black hole mass, or do we need a higher black hole mass and lower stellar mass? So this is what's known as a degeneracy when you have sort of two different um, scenarios that can be, you have the same scenario explained by two different um, situations with the stars and the black hole. So let's talk about uh, NGC 6861 now. Uh, this is again, a nice giant optical galaxy here that has a previous black hole mass measurement of about 2 billion times the mass of the sun. And if we zoom in to the very center of the galaxy, we do see a nice extended dust disk here. And we can also see that there is sort of a, an absence or a dearth of both dust and gas uh, at the very center here, there's a, there's a hole. The origins of these holes are not entirely clear, but I will sort of tell you that it is going to be an important factor in this measurement. So punchline, uh, the black hole mass from the models that I, I fit to this data um, give a black hole mass of about one to three billion times the mass of the sun. It's a pretty broad range. The reduced chi square of the models are close to two, indicating there is some uh, systematic deviations um, that are not quite, um, that, are, that, that are between the model and the data. And again, we can take a look at the different model versus data comparisons here. We have the line profiles with the models in blue, the data in black. Of the position uh, velocity diagram here, we can sort of see that there is no, uh, there's no bright emission of CO in the innermost parts of this, of this disk. And we can take a look at the, the moment maps here. Models are not fit to over the entire disk because the, the disk structure might have things like rings or some substructure that would not be well modeled by a simple thin disk model. And so we have to typically restrict the model fits to regions where we think there isn't, there are, those features aren't there. Okay, so as I said before, really the, the hole in this system um, really limits the precision on the black hole mass in this galaxy, right? So the hole radius, if we just take the black hole masses that I've derived from my models or the previous measurement, um, it's bigger than the expected sphere of influence by a factor of two to three, right? So for example, this if this yellow ellipse sort of represents in a cartoonish way, you know, the, the volume or the, the area where the black hole is the, you know, calling the shots in terms of the gravitational potential, then the hole means that there's just nothing orbiting it in that region, right? So there's no dynamical tracers that we can use. We have to sort of use tracers that are further out, but when we're further out, that's of course where the stars make up a larger fraction of the enclosed mass. So I also tried to find a lower limit to this measurement, but essentially finding what is sort of the lowest black hole mass that can be, uh, used in the models that can still somewhat fit the data and um, a lower limit of about 100 million times the mass of the sun. So about a full order of magnitude from uh, 1 billion is sort of the, the low end on what uh, it can do in terms of reproducing the observed kinematics. So takeaways, dust complicates this process when you try and convert the two-dimensional surface brightness seen in Hubble images into mass models for the host galaxy. Uh, because we assume, again, we want to think that the mass follows the light, but again, if there is dust in the way, we don't have a great idea of what the light intrinsically is. And these disks, like in the case of 6861, may have features such as you know, holes that, because of them, we don't have good dynamical constraints to use to get a precise measurement on the black hole mass. So that's what, those are the main takeaways from that work. Now, I'd like to move on to the second project that I applied this framework to on the black hole masses of NGC 4786 and 5193. Um, I'd like to highlight that this work started as a, as a couple of Calbridge summer projects that were conducted by the amazing undergraduates I had the honor of supervising, Janelle Sai and Jason Flores Velasquez, who I advised over the summers of 2020 and 2021. I always say that they are the first people to measure the black hole mass 
in the systems and they should carry that with them for the, for the rest of their life. And let's get started with 4786, which was Janelle's target. Um, this is a giant elliptical galaxy that had no prior black hole mass measurement, has a fairly small in projection dust disk at the center of the galaxy that again is well traced by the CO emission there. Now, punchline for the result, the black hole mass in this system is about 500 million or half a billion times the mass of the sun. Again, a uh, fairly small statistical uncertainty of about 4%, but with a much larger, larger systematic uncertainty of about 30%. Um, that's bit model has a reduced chi squared of about 1.4. So again, good, good fit, but not statistically acceptable for 363 uh, degrees of freedom. So we can take a quick look at the different visualizations here. We got the line profiles on the right side again with the models in blue and the, and the data in black. We can see that in the data, there, is, there are these sort of small scale variations, channel to channel variations in the cube that while our models can get the sort of the overall shape right, we just can't get those sort of fine details um, reproduced that well. Uh, if we take a look at the rotation curve or the position velocity diagram on the left here with the velocity on the y-axis, the distance from the center on the, on the x-axis, you can see, again see that the models do a, a pretty good job of getting the, the overall shape correct. So again, one last visualization, the moment maps. We can also sort of see in, the, in this top left plot, this is the surface brightness in the day, we can sort of see that there is, um, there's hints of a deficit of CO emission or just faint emission of the gas at that, um, at that location, which we can also sort of see in the residuals here. Kind of, we can sort of think of it in a way sort of akin to a mini hole, like in the case of 6861, where there's just you know, very faint or little information that we can use there um, in the disk. And I'll, I'll talk more about this actually in the next target, because that's also um, prominent as well. So again, kind of reiterating the lessons we learned from the first project, it's really the differences in the, in the mass profiles and how you construct them um, that lead to large differences in the black hole mass. So I'm gonna show an image here and I'll go ahead and explain it. So what you're looking at are isophote plots. So these are ellipses of constant surface brightness. The red is from the MGEs and black is from the Hubble Space Telescope image that it's trying to model and fit. And I've created three versions here. So essentially you can imagine creating different uh, MGE models, different ways of accounting for how much stellar mass you have. And the idea is that depending on which one you pick, right, you can have a, a broad range in the black hole mass of about 30% from the best fitting value of about um, 500 million times the mass of the sun. We can also take again, a look at the enclosed mass of the stellar mass profiles as a function of log radius represented by the different colored curves here. And as you can see, depending on which one we use in our models, we get a different answer for black hole mass. And again, Towards the disk edge, the models or the, the the stellar mass agrees amongst the models because the mass budget is well constrained at the, the large uh, towards the disk edge. But as we move towards you know, the resolution limit of the telescope and then the sphere of influence of the black hole represented by the yellow shaded band here, these differences sort of drive these differences in the stellar mass profiles drive the, the big differences in black hole mass. So Next target is uh, NGC 5193, that was Jason's galaxy. And again, no prior black hole mass measurement in the system, has a nice disk that has evidence of a central hole again of dust and gas. If we look at the, the color map and the CO2 to one emission from, from ALMA. And so the best fitting black hole mass in this case, about 100, three million times the mass of the sun. Small statistical uncertainty like before, but a very, very large systematic uncertainty for, by about a factor of two. 
and our models, again, are uh, not getting all of the features seen in the data entirely correct. So you can take a look at the line profiles on the right-hand side. And again, the idea is that sort of the shape of the observed line profiles are, are more or less correct, but the sort of small scale variations um, are not entirely captured. Um, but again, the from the rotation curve on the left here, you can sort of see that the model does do a, a pretty good job of getting the features in the data correct. Then we can take a look at the moment maps here of surface brightness, line of sight velocity, and line of sight velocity dispersion. And again, the top left plot, we can see that there is evidence of just a deficit or maybe a mini hole of, of uh, just a hole where there's no CO emission readily available for us to use. And, and, and we think that it's one of the main factors that could be driving this, this large systematic uncertainty. Again, sort of as before, we can look at multi-Gaussian expansion model fits to the Hubble Space Telescope data. And I think the thing I want to emphasize is that you can, you can see here that the models in red are doing a pretty good job amongst all of them to fit the, the even the earmost part of this galaxy, even within the dust disk itself. And you know, you you might think to yourself that you know you could really pick either one or any one of these three, and there shouldn't be too much of a difference. But the story is that indeed there is a big difference depending on what model you choose to use. And again, this might illustrate it even better if we take a look at the enclosed mass plot of the MGE models and the log radius plot, we can see that the resolution limit of the telescope is much larger than the uh, spheres of influence from the different models I've gotten. So again, we're sort of in this regime where the stars make up the majority of the mass budget. And while the models agree very well, the stellar models agree very well uh, towards the disk edge, they don't really agree well um, inwards of the resolution limit and then within the sphere of influence. And because of these differences, we have this um, degeneracy between black hole mass and um, stellar mass. So some key takeaways from project number two. Systematic uncertainties associated with the extinction corrections, or pretty much how you handle the dust in these systems, are pretty much the dominant source of the uncertainty in the measurement. And that's why it's vital to just really incorporate a range of models that can pretty much give us a, a bound on how much extinction or dimming of light that, um, that is present in these systems. And it's very important when these observations do not resolve the sphere of influence. Not a lot of works in the literature really take attention or pay attention to the details of this process. Um, thus is typically not seen as that much of a limiting factor, but I'm arguing here that from based on what I'm showing that it, it really is, it can bias these measurements by up to a factor of two. Okay, so we'll have some time to talk about the results for the final four galaxies. I will not get into all of them in detail, unfortunately, but I now have to confess I've been holding out on you. I have another way of parameterizing the host galaxy so we can do it not just with the Hubble images, but we can do it with this non-parametric approach we'll talk about now. It's called the VX method or the V extended method. Um, I know it's kind of a funny name, but the idea here is that you have, um, essentially you're trying to create a, a, a mass model for this system across the entire disk. And so the way that it works is that we start by creating N logarithmic bins. So essentially we just select N radii that span the length of the disk. And we're enforcing at the very center, just the mass of the black hole to be there. So we're, there's not gonna be any stars there. It's just the black hole at the very center. And the idea is that at each radius, we're going to assign a given amount of stellar mass. And then um, we're going to effectively interpolate this profile, this, this mass profile across the disk. And then to give you an idea of how this works, and I should say before I do that, why is it called the VX model? It's about mass. In the end, these, um, mass values, this mass profile gets converted into 
essentially a circular velocity curve that represents the velocity of a test particle in orbit around this mass distribution from the stars. And so just to give you another way to visualize this, so you have different amounts of stellar mass at, at a given distance from the center that span the disk edge length. And um, what the models are doing, we're adding more free parameters in models. So what's happening is that these um, free parameters are being adjusted in the models and we're trying to find the best overall fit um, in terms of, we're trying to find the best you know, values where those stars are located to reproduce the observed um, data. Now you might be wondering why would you ever want to do that? And I'll tell you soon. So first, let me show you a table of preliminary results of the black hole mass measurements, um, the last four. So we have the galaxy in this column, the black hole mass in units of 100 million times the mass of the sun and the reduced chi squared, which kind of host galaxy models were tried. So some interesting notes about these galaxies. 3245 was previously measured by my advisor uh, back in 2001 with ionized gas dynamical modeling, had a black hole mass of about 210 million times the mass of the sun. Um, NGC 4435 has an upper limit from ionized gas dynamical modeling, as in the authors of this work are saying the black hole mass should be no more than seven and a half million times the mass of the sun. You can obviously see there's some uh, disagreement there. I'll get into that. And the, the final two um, have no prior black hole mass measurements. 5838 has one of the most clear signs of a stellar and black hole mass degeneracy I've ever seen. Um, I won't have time to talk about it here in this talk, but we can talk about it later. It is quite an interesting case. Yes, David. Yes. Yeah, question. Uh, for the top two, yes. we're using the VX method. Uh, for these observations uh, with Alma, are they well resolved? And is, it, is this a case where you, you know, the radius of influence is just very well by our data? Uh, not so much. Um, so the sphere of influence, so the, the resolutions, I believe, for 3245 we're talking about maybe 0.25 arc seconds. And for that black hole mass, I don't think that quite, or for at least the black hole mass that Aaron got, I don't believe that quite resolves it. And then the, for 4435, um, it's really, un, if we're just assuming this value, it's it's really unresolved. I, the, the resolutions, I think are close to like 0.4 arc seconds or maybe 0.35 arc seconds. So it's not quite, um, Similar. I'm trying. I'm really, I'm trying to get a feel yeah. for is why you use the edge for the top. Ah, ah. I, I, I assume the top two must be at least better resolved uh, for you to do that. Because otherwise, I don't know why. I mean, the VX method in principle be applied to any case. Right. Uh, I, I assume it was, it's virtues to be applied in the case where you know the black hole is well resolved, sphere of influence, and therefore you can you can get the stellar mass that way. Yes, so I, I I do have a reason for why it was used, and I'll I'll show it in the oh, in the coming slide. Yeah, I'll no, no, no worries. Yeah, so David uh, was um, was on the ball here. He he pointed out something. I said, why on earth would you want to use the VX method anyway? Um, so here's I'll give you some um, idea. So here's thirty two forty five. Let's say we just want to use a multi-Gaussian expansion, and we fit this over the entire disk, just to sort of get an idea of how good an MGE can fit the model. So this is a full disk fit using just one MGE and one free parameter, the stellar mass to light um, profile. And we can see when we fit to the full disk, um, we don't really see agreement, right? So the, the models are converging on a sort of an overmassive black hole. We, we have this, um, a sharp rise in the central um, velocity that is not seen in the data, and the the overall you know shape of this of this PVD and just where the velocities are don't match very well. Um, Reduced chi squared of about you know, six. So okay, you know maybe so full disk fits with an MGE, no good. Um, maybe we can try just fitting to sort of the inner maybe half arc second. That's kind of where Aaron fit the ionized gas dynamical models in two thousand one. Why don't we just fit to the inner? one arc second, so we can do that. Um, and we do uh, a little bit better. Um, so again, we have, um, if we just fit 
between pixels, um, between the white lines, uh, we do have a black hole mass that sort of more falls in line with the previously accepted result. But again, it's not a great model fit. And we can see, you know, even in the, the previous examples, like for 1380, 68, 61, where we're fitting to not even the, the full disk, the, the PBDs in those cases for the best with models, they do actually fit the structure even out beyond the radii the models were fit to very, very well. Whereas we can see for 3245, an, an MGE fit to you know, the full disk as well to maybe the smallest radii that we can, we can get reasonable constraints on. Um, it's not getting that overall kinematic structure um, very well. And so the idea was with the VX model, can we just get, get sort of the large scale kinematics right and you know, have, a, have a model that at least gets the large scale kinematics correct, and then we can look about maybe getting the innermost part correct as well. Yes. Sorry to follow up again on that issue. So yeah. what is it? I mean, the MGE is a fairly general uh, description. I mean, yeah. in theory, can't you just keep adding you know, more and more and more components to, to, to match up with it? To, to I mean, I'm just trying to see what, what you're really getting in the virtue. Yeah. Is it just the VX just allows you to do this a little bit more simply? Yeah, I mean, it's a million more in a way, yes, it's sort of to give the models just more flexibility, flexibility to to have, um, you know, free parameters spread out across because the MGE profiles that like the, the mass profiles or the circular velocity profiles we derive the, the shapes from the MGE are kind of fixed right in the sense that the, the overall shape and the slope of the profile is fixed, but you can scale it by the, the mass to light ratio free parameter. But you don't have the flexibility for it to sort of change the sort of the slope or the shape of it at at uh, radii between zero and, and the disk edge. And so, because of the VX model, the idea is we can sort of create maybe a more maybe it's not physically motivated, but we can just get a better overall fit to what's the observed velocity seen in the data. Sorry, because it's being changed during the taking process. Yes, because the the those those free the MG start set. Right, right. So the idea is that we have free parameters at you know different radii across this disk, and the the VX model can effectively just you know move up and down parameter space to find the the optimal values that fit the observed structure. Um, that's satisfying. <laughs> that's fine. No, no. Okay. That sounds good. In theory, I guess you could reverse engineer it. You take yeah. the mass profile and create an MGU. Yeah, no, actually, there has been talks about that. I don't know if we've we've gone to that. We got to that at that point. But just to show you what the VX can do, um, here's what it can do. If you do allow it to have in this example, we can we can also we can also set how many free parameters we we want to fit over this entire disk. Typically, you set it to the amount of sort of resolution elements that you fit across the entire disk. So in this case, it was about uh, I think ten, and Again, this is fit to the over the entire disk, not just the innermost one arc second. And we can see that the the VX model does uh, a, you know does actually recreate the observed structure pretty well. I mean, it does get that central downturn um, in the observed data well. It doesn't have that sort of um, sharp rise in velocity we saw with the the full disk um, MGE fit, and it's giving a black hole mass that is more comparable to um, to the previously established range, but does, it does fall outside of it. So again, it's not a, an ideal um, a statistically acceptable fit there. So that was kind of the motivation that could we just get the large scale kinematics right? There were some ideas of maybe we can just create this you know, non-parametric mass model and we're just, and we can, uh, or this is what I was trying to do. I could just fix it in my models and say this, you know, this, VX is giving me sort of the best representation of what the stars are doing or what the, you know, the, the circular the circular velocity profile of what the of the stars, what it's doing. And, um, you know, it does the best job um, in terms of the full disk structure, but clearly it's not um, a perfect fit and um, haven't gotten to the point as to what, what we do next after here, but that's a, that's our next challenge. Same thing for 4435, actually. So again, we can play the same sort of game where, again, we fit in MGE, you know, with one free parameter across the entire disk. 
and uh, you know we get a black hole mass that is you know 90 million times the mass of the sun, much higher than the uh, assumed well, not assumed but the derived upper limit in the previous work. But again, just a really poor overall fit to the data. There's just some complex things going on in the data that, that the models are not quite doing. So again, okay, full disk, no good. Maybe we try, you know, inner, you know, parts of the disk and um, okay, a little bit better, but still not great. Um, a black hole mass of about uh, 50 million times the mass of the sun. And then finally, again, the, the thought was maybe now we try the VX method, we give it the most, you know, flexibility in the model to just try and fit the observed structure. And okay, um, again, not a great fit. Um, so overall, gets the shape, I'd say, better um, than the, the MGE models, but there's clearly something going on in the data that our models are just not able to capture. Perhaps there's you know, significant warping, perhaps there's you know complex kinematics where it's not perfectly circularly rotating gas. Um, it's it's hard to know at the moment that the the next steps have not been um, planned out at the moment for for these two um, in terms of what needs to be done. Though there has been talk of maybe extending the models the models to incorporate maybe tilted ring structure to get the maybe the warping part more accurately represented, but uh, I haven't had time to look at that before all the dissertation stuff. But to conclude. Um, I just want to leave my, well, this is not the last slide, so I won't leave, but I'll have my key findings and significance here. Um, the results of my dissertation are eight hole, eight black hole mass measurements. Uh, two are published, two are in review. Four of them are sort of preliminary, initial stage work. Five of them are black hole mass measurements and systems that have no prior past measurement. And then there are three cross checks. I use that loosely with 3245 and 4435, just because the, the results I think warrant a cautious interpretation just because our, our model fits are not great. So it's, it's, it's uh, maybe pro, uh, too soon to derive any um, strong conclusions there. Um, and I think the overall point of the dissertation when I think about it is now, how do you carry out these black hole mass measurements in sort of non-optimal scenarios where we're working in the regime where the stars are really dominating gravity and we don't have sort of sharp central rises in the central velocity of the gas. Um, we might have holes in the distribution. We might have other features as well that are hard to account for in the models. And I think uh, my hope is that other, that this will uh, inspire change in the, studies of black hole mass measurements with ALMA. Now on that actually, um, interestingly, ALMA for the, is, is now 10 years old. It's been in operation since 2013. And what I thought would be cool is to compile all the past black hole mass measurements with ALMA dating all the way back to, I believe it's the 2015 one here. So we have eight years worth of black hole mass measurements. There's 35 carried out in unique targets with ALMA. Um, so 25 of them are uh, published results. Uh, 10 of those are, are either in preparation or they're featured um, in my dissertation. And one thing I've done here is I've put all the past measurements um, that are not mine onto an M sigma relation plot here with the black hole mass on the, or the log of the black hole mass on the Y axis and the cellular velocity dispersion on the X axis. And I've also color coded them based on how well resolved the black hole sphere of influence is. So down here, we're in the, the Pac-Man regime, I say, and then the anti-Pac-Man regime here, I say. And as you can see, most measurements are sort of made in that Pac-Man regime. The stars are dominating the, the gravity. And I would like to also point out, and I don't wanna make any enemies when I say this, but not all of these measurements um, go into the level of detail of the systematics and understanding how the dust or these other features that you see in these systems can affect the final result. So dust has been one of those issues that we've been trying to convince people in the work that it's something they should pay attention to and should account for in their models, but um, I don't think have done in a sufficiently adequate way quite yet. And you know, when I look at this, 
I find this amusing because when you know, people ask me, you know, what is your research about? What do you actually do? Um, I jokingly will tell them I make a bunch of measurements that end up becoming plots, uh, dots on a plot. And so these are all the dots on a plot for the other black hole mass measurements made with ALMA. And these are, and that will conclude the science portion of this um, presentation. I'd just like to have a few minutes to get into acknowledgements. I will put this back on at the end. So just some brief acknowledgements here at the end. I'd like to first and foremost, uh, thank my PhD advisor, Aaron Barth. Oh, um, sorry, wrong picture of Aaron. Um, Aaron Barth uh, here, um, dominating the galaxy. And um, what can I say? Um, you know, five years ago, Aaron took a chance on a graduate student who had no experience in astronomy whatsoever, had self-admittedly very dubious Python skills and that are probably still do self-admittedly. Um, and he's just been the uh, best advisor I could have picked in my extensive search that I did with my interrogation of him. But uh, in all honesty, it's been uh, just an absolute honor to learn from him and his just vast and encyclopedic knowledge of astronomy. And you know, despite the inordinate amount of roles and hats he wears at UC Irvine or as uh, part of committees within UC observatories, you know, he always makes time for his graduate students, and it's just you know really inspiring to see the, the sheer amount of work that he does. And it's because of his wide net of collaborations that I've been able to participate in other projects than just the ones featured that, that I told you about today. So I've been able to do some observing at Lick because of him, gotten to go to some pretty cool places because, because of him, as I will show in the next slide. So uh, these are all sort of trips that Aaron has uh, generously sponsored. I've been able to participate in uh, just different workshops and uh, to broaden my knowledge in astronomy, present my research at meetings and conferences. And um, I admittedly, I will miss the free travel and housing that comes with these uh, kinds of trips, but honestly, I will miss having Aaron as my PhD advisor even more. So Aaron, thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to thank my committee members, uh, James Bullock and David Buat. Um, I had the pleasure of being a student in a couple of David's uh, graduate astronomy courses here at UC Irvine. And as someone who, like I said, no prior experience with astronomy, those, those courses were you know, absolutely fundamental in my development. He's also been involved with the ALMA project since, since its inception, before I even arrived here at UC Irvine. I, I benefited greatly from his feedback and input in all the papers and conference abstracts over the years. So thank you, David. Um, James, uh, I think I can safely speak for all the physics and astronomy graduate students that under your leadership as chair a few years ago, our department has ascended to new heights with different programs and initiatives that you supported wholeheartedly that have benefited so many of the students. And now that you are the dean of the School of Physical Sciences, I think that not only will this you know, School of Physical Sciences ascend, but the whole university as and as a whole will ascend with you in a leadership position. Uh, just the energy you're able to put into not only doing great science, but also great science communication and outreach is very inspiring to young scientists who like to participate in those activities like myself. And so thank you for agreeing to be on my committee. Next, I'd like to have a well overspoken quote in science that if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants by the great Isaac Newton. And the, the giant that I have stood on this entire PhD has to be uh, Ben Boisel. Literally, I am standing on his shoulder here. He literally carried me to the end of this um, PhD. For those of you who don't know, Ben uh, is currently a professor at Brigham Young University in Utah. But before that, he was my predecessor here at UCI. And he also got his PhD as a student of Aaron's in 2018. So we briefly overlapped here in the department. His last year was my first year, but even in that short amount of time that we had together, Ben was just you know, absolutely instrumental in helping me launch my project off the ground. It was, it was him 
who provided the initial snippet of code that became the, the foundational basis for the framework that I developed. So, you know, it, it really couldn't have gotten started without his help and contribution. And he did pretty much all of the heavy lifting when it comes to calibrating and reducing all my data sets for us dynamical modelers over here and over at Brigham Young, over at Texas A&M. And uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Ben owns the record for the most precisely measured black hole mass with ALMA to date. And if our collaboration is lucky in terms of getting more ALMA time, may very well have a chance of getting another one of the most precisely measured black hole mass to date, but we'll, we'll, we'll see about that if we're lucky. Um, like I said, he's just mentored and taught several of the dynamical modelers like myself of these systems. I think that I can speak for all of us that he's not just a brilliant scientist, but he's also a very compassionate and kind individual. I've sent him over the years dozens of what I call distress emails when I was stuck on a problem and with my framework or I was getting some nonsense results that didn't make sense. And he would always respond with paragraphs of, of detail and saying, yeah, have you tried this? This is what could happen. This is why you should try it like this. And, you know, those are the kinds of interactions that really helped me develop as a scientist. And I don't, I don't think I can thank him enough for all the years of support. I'd also like to thank Vivian Yu for coming all the way back from, I believe, Greece <laughs> last night just to attend this talk. Um, Vivian has been here at UC Irvine as both a postdoc and now a research scientist with her own group. Everyone should check out her awesome PBS Nova special on work with the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, Vivian has just, even though we haven't done directly overlapping projects together, Vivian has been a great observing partner on nights when I was observing with like observatory. We looked at a lot of quasars together, right? She made sure I didn't uh, slam the telescope into the ground or something. Um, and she's just been a constant source of positive energy um, in our group over the past several years, especially when I was um, when I was first here at UC Irvine, I, I was the only graduate student in Aaron's group for about a couple of years. And so having that postdoc presence um, who was um, there to support and guide me through those initial first years of graduate school. Um, I just, I can't thank you enough. Thank you, Vivian. Last, I have no time to go through this entire um, slide. So just to my friends and my family, um, my friends, just thank you so much for being here with me, both here in person or here on Zoom. I wish I could single you all out individually and tell you why uh, and how much I appreciate every single one of you and your friendship. Uh, I think the committee would accuse me of stalling for time if I did that. So I will just have to briefly say that I'm so happy that we met. We've stayed in contact over all of these years, whether I met you back in high school or my undergraduate days at UC Merced or here at UC Irvine as UCI graduate students or other graduate students at other universities who we've gotten to know each other at meetings or conferences. You know, I'm just so spoiled, I think, to have so many talented and kind friends who just make me want to be the best version of myself. It just makes me wonder how, how or why I'm so lucky to have you all. And so thank you so much for being here with me today. And I hope to see you all very soon. And now, of course, lastly, um, to my family who are watching on Zoom, um, no words can adequately express how grateful I am for all of your love and your support you've given me over the years. And I want you to know how much I love you too. Uh, you've never dissuaded me from persuading, from pursuing what I was passionate about when I said I wanted to switch from engineering to physics. You were like, okay, do it. Um, never discouraged me at all. Just said, go after what you want. If you wanna do physics, do it to the, to the nth degree. And so I am uh, eternally grateful for all the opportunities you've provided me and the sacrifices you've made to put me in a position to succeed um, since I was born, all the sacrifices that have had to be made. Um, I had a great chance at education at essentially every step of my life because of my family's um, support. And it's mind blowing that it's all gonna finally culminate with this PhD. And so again, I love you and thank you so much. And with that, I think that concludes my long talk. And so I will leave you with the last slide of my presentation with the table of all the ALMA black hole mass measurements and mine sort of circled and highlighted here. And I will now take any questions you may have. Thank you.
Yes, David. Uh, yeah, I I had a question. I, I should know the answer to this, but I, I confess I, I don't. And I'm not sure how uh, how good of a, a reliable question it is because do you remember or can you remind me? Uh, are the quality of bits better? For the two galaxies in which we do have the very high resolution, these were before you, 1332 and 3258. Yes. I, I can't remember. Was the juice chi squared closer to one over those ones? Yes, I believe so. I believe for um, 30, I believe for 1332, it depends on where the models were fit across the disk, but I believe they were like 1.1 or lower yeah. that Aaron got. Um, still, I think the the criterion for statistically acceptable was like 1.0 something, so it was still a little bit mismatched. For 3258, I I want to say again, it depend. Ben had made a lot of models in that paper, um, but I think for the best fitting result, it was something about 1.2 or one point well, between 1.1 and 1.2 for, and, and that was using like sort of a VX model with a tilted ring and having like 40 degrees of freedom, or it's not freedom, but 40 free parameters, I should say. And then follow up. The question I was, the, the real question I was going to ask was if you had insight or suggestions, thoughts, what, you know, could be, you know, uh, ways to improve these, these fits and, and such. And it sounds like just making that comparison, at least focusing just on the smaller regions, it helps rather than trying to model the larger regions to cover that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I spent some time, I, I, I got some time to try and develop sort of a tilted ring method like Ben did. I, and I'd like to try and apply it to 3245 and 4435, because I mean, we are, sort of, we are assuming in these models that the disk is perfectly thin um, and that we're ignoring any sort of like kinematic warps or stuff like that. And like for like 3245, for example, I mean, there is, um, there is evidence of like star formation in the disk that could be disrupting the, the gas kinematics at different radii. Um, there is a low luminosity AGN in that system. Uh, there is just a lot of factors that uh, to account for. I do think trying the tilted ring with these more extended disks would be good, but there's also a limit as to how useful they are. So there's sort of like a, in terms of how inclined the disks are, it, it might not even work in those cases. So. Vivian, yes. Oh, thank you. Um, I have several questions, so I'll try to do it. Okay. Uh, my first question is uh, not so, so helpful. Um, we can go in the wrong way to go to it. But I'm recalling from my FMA days that the uh, high core real year um, spirometers have always said it's better to um, model a UV plane over the negative plane. And I was wondering whether you can comment a little bit on that, um, you know, how it's better than kinematics or what, whether it's somewhat plus. Um, my second and the more general question is, you know, regarding your your headline plot, you know, if you if extinction is kind of a major source of um, the discrepancy that explain the difference between the different colors and the gas measurements, can we, you know, take the headline measurements and basically apply more systematic uh, measurements and actually bring them to kind of have sort of agreement um, to the headline that might be um, I'm glad to see that this Pac-Man joke is is going into actual scientific conversation. Um, yeah, so those are those are two really good questions. I'm going to make sure I, I got them right. So the first one is talking about UV plane fitting. Now, just for people who may not know, the the Alma cubes themselves are not the um, they're not the final form of the the data. So the data is measured with interferometers, and there is a lot of technical details. It measures the Measures essentially a correlation function on the sky of the electromagnetic radiation on the point gets Fourier transformed into a cube. There's a lot of um, things going on there. And yeah, so UV plane modeling is typically thought to be better than image plane modeling, just for the reason, as you said, the, the errors or the noise in the image in the Fourier UV plane are typically assumed to be Gaussian and uncorrelated. It would be great to do model fits there. Um, no one has tried to do dynamical mass measurements or model dynamical rotation 
in the UV plane for black hole mass measurements. I will say that some exciting things are happening in the field of uh, protoplanetary systems. People are making sort of stellar mass measurements of, of, of measuring the masses of protostars. And the idea is that they are model fitting in the UV plane. And the way it's done, and I've, I've looked into this and in trying to figure out a way to do it in a very non-computationally expensive way, and I haven't succeeded at it. But the idea is that you take these cubes, right? So these cubes are in the image plane, and then you can do some transformations. You essentially can do an inverse Fourier transform, sample those, you know, sample the, the, the model points in the UV plane where the observations were taken, and then do, you know, you can do, I think they're doing even Bayesian you know, inference, uh, maybe not even just chi-squared fitting in that case, which is again, very computational. Like the whole process of getting it back into the UV plane is already computationally expensive and then doing a, a Bayesian framework. Um, it almost makes my little computer just want to explode, I think. So yeah, the, the, it would be great. I, I have thought about it and I'd love to try it though, have yet to sort of to break apart how the you know people in the protoplanetary community do it and then apply into this framework. So. That addresses that. Um, as for when working in the you know so-called um, you know anti-Pac-Man regime, the the sort of the the benefit of this right is that if we're working in the in the left plot here for the people on Zoom, the idea is that the black hole is such a you know we want to work in a in a case where the black hole was so dominant that any sort of discrepancy in the stellar mass profile due to the dust. Is really not going to make much of a difference, and, and we can sort of see that in the in the case that Ben, um, when Ben modeled NGC thirty two fifty eight, he had a, a a host of dust corrected models that did have a large range of expected extinction, but even that systematic uncertainty didn't shift the black hole mass more than I forgot the exact number, but something like ten percent. I forgot the exact number, but it was not as large as what we see here. So. If we work in a case where the gas is sort of found deep within the black hole sphere of influence, then the you know, then the stars, any sort of uncertainty in the stars is sort of subsumed and it's it's not, you know, uh, it doesn't carry a large uncertainty on the final black hole mass. So yeah. Yes. Okay, so it might be very dumb question, but no, you you've got you were here where you hear about the stellar mass. Yes. Um, you talk about the dust, you talk about the other two minutes. So you have a two D image, and that's like a three D quantity. Yeah. So aren't there big differences there? I mean, there is it possible to have very different three D structures of mass that produce the same, even for a fixed mass yeah. like yeah. the same Yeah. Six or the same scale, but different types. Right. So um, just to reiterate the, the questions, I understand so people can hear it again. The question is regarding when you have. Um, multi-Gaussian expansions, let me get that slide here. The idea here, again, is that we have this 2D image of the galaxy, um, and but we, what we really care about is sort of the 3D intrinsic you know, structure. These, these galaxies are inherently 3D. Now, um, you're right, there are uh, a lot of different you know, deep projections of three-dimensional structures down to 2D that can give rise to this. Typically what is done in the community is that we have to make, we, we make some assumptions on the shape of the, of the Gaussian with the multi-Gaussian expansion, we usually assume axis symmetry. We usually fix the Gaussians to have the same center, the same sort of position angle, um, has to be in the same inclination. We, we, we assume the stars and the gas are essentially co-rotating in the disk. Of course, there's some you know, issues with you know, maybe photometric and kinematic misalignment between the stars. There, we take a lot of liberties, right? And so we, um, and it makes it, you know, we, we can still generate fairly good represent, 2D representations, but, um, it is hard to get at the heart of, you know, what really is the, the three-dimensional structure. I will say there are, um, I, I looked into this for a little bit, there are codes that actually try and, I'm um, oh, sorry, there are codes that try to model the intrinsic um, brightness distribution of these galaxies in the presence of dusty disks. And so what essentially these models do is that they you know, account for, you know, scattering within the disk, they account for the dust disk geometry, they account for all these different factors. Um, and they pretty much have a dust distribution and a stellar distribution, like an intrinsic star distribution, um, which is three-dimensional. And then you can, essentially the, the, the idea there was to try and use that in systems like this, just, you know, have a model for the dust, have a model for the stars. And we just say, okay, we, we take this as our best estimate of the stars and the, the three distribution, what is it? 
But yes, so the final answer is we take a lot of liberties with uh, the deep projection problem. Questions from the room? Uh, any questions on Zoom, anyone? I'll unmute so people can speak if they have anything to say. No questions? Doesn't look like the honest question. If not, then I think we need a few minutes for the committee to discuss the Okay. It is unanimous that you've done a great job. And uh, <laughs> to our doctor, have a doctor. Have a